God's people said, amen, amen, amen and amen. Tonight we have a guest with us. You know we don't have uh, missionaries very often on Wednesday nights, uh, but we're glad that they're with us tonight. And this is Colin and Callie Hendricks. And they got two little sweet kids, and they're back in the nursery. But Brother Colin, if you'll come at this time and share with us what God is doing with you, and introduce your family a little more formally, give a little testimony. He's going to preach a word, okay? Amen. 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 good with that tonight? Amen. Amen. God bless you, Brother Collins. Amen. Like I said, we are the Hendricks family going to London, England, my wife Callie, and then our two hooligans in the back. <laughs> Hadley, who is four, and Bo, who is two. Amen. We are thankful they are in other rooms <laughs> where they can be loud. Amen. So we're thankful for that. My wife gets to listen and enjoy tonight. Amen. So yeah, thankful for that. We are going to London, England. God called us to go to England in the late summer of 2021. <laughs> And we were at Bethany Baptist Church in Lubbock, Texas. And can I tell you, we loved every single second of it. Amen. I was the youth pastor and the music director there. I said that wrong. I was the youth guy and the wannabe music director. <laughs> <laughs> I pretended a whole lot. Yeah. And um, but, but the Lord blessed those ministries. We saw growth in both of those. The music ministry was thriving. The youth department was growing. We were seeing kids saved and baptized. And the Lord was just doing a great work. And you know... We, we would have people come up to us, and they would say in the foyer to us all the time, they'd say, now, Brother Colin, Miss Callie, y'all better not leave us. And and that sounds kind of weird for someone to say, but at Bethany, sometimes the staff was kind of in and out because they'd get some training, and then someone wanted them to go pastor or something. And so they would say that to us, and I'd say, you know what, we're not going to leave unless two, one or two things happens. I get fired, or the Lord wants us to go somewhere. Yeah. Well, the Lord began to work in our hearts when I took over the missions stuff, is kind of how I say that. And I would vet missionaries, I'd make sure our missionaries that we supported at Bethany were getting their support, would look over their letters, talk with our mission support team, and, and things like that to make sure our missionaries get taken care of from where we could help. And the Lord used that time to broaden my scope to see the need of the world, which we, we hear that, you know, there's billions of souls that need to be saved, and there are. But when you start to read those letters and you start to have names that your missionaries are are ministering to and trying to see saved, and you hear about them getting saved and baptized and, and just hear the Lord working, well, we started to pray more specifically for the Lord to, to send laborers. You know, he says, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers. Amen. And so we began to pray for laborers to go. And through a series of events, God, God put England in the forefront of our minds. Amen. And we began to pray that the Lord would send somebody. Now when I say somebody, that doesn't mean the Hendricks family. <laughs> that meant somebody. And so we were praying that the Lord would send somebody to go to England, and specifically London, because, because we didn't know very many people that were there. And we're finding more and more out about people that are in the UK now that were on deputation. But at the time, we only knew of a handful, and we were asking God just to send people. Just, to, to, just for people to see the burden and the need and to go. And um, we were asking for somebody else, like I said, and then he made it clear it was us. Yeah. Now, I have a list of a whole lot of excuses, if I can right. just be completely honest with you. I'm from Abilene, Texas, um, and so one of, the, one of the most specific ones that I can just give you an example of was I told the Lord, I said, God, I've never left the country, and I'm from West Texas. How are you going to send a West Texas boy? To London, England. Yeah. That's what I said. Now, I mean, he created me. He put me where I was, and he knew how he was going to do it, but I was questioning him. So I, I asked the Lord just to just to erase all my excuses that I had, right. and he's gracious. And so he erased every single one of those. And, yeah. and the way he erased my West Texas excuse was we had a guest preacher from Fort Worth, and he was uh, preaching our anniversary Sunday. And he started to tell his family's testimony. And... He was talking about how he and his brother and his dad, they all got saved. His mom got saved. Their whole family got saved. And now he's a pastor, and his brother is a missionary. You never guess where. In England. Wow. And you'll never guess where they're from. Midland, Texas. Wow. That's the far west side of Texas. And so the Lord just, just made it clear through a, just a whole lot of answered prayer that we were supposed to go. Amen. So we told, we told our pastor, and we told our church. We took a survey trip, and on that survey trip, we asked the Lord for a real-life experience. Now, that's a dangerous prayer. I found out. 
I didn't think it was a bad one, but I, mean, I don't know if it's bad, but it was good for us. And while on our survey trip, we just got a real life England experience. It poured down rain. It was really cold. The wind blew a whole lot. We were supposed to take a train trip one day and the wind was blowing over 100 miles per hour over the entire country. And um, they don't run trains when that's happening for good reason. <laughs> and so we, we had to figure out how to get across country. Praise the Lord, they speak some type of English there. And so we can kind of <laughs> run. While there, we also, we also all got, um, you know, we all got COVID while we were there. Um, and Bo, he was so sick, we, he went to respiratory distress. And so he had to go to the ER in a foreign country. I mean, it was good. It was a good experience. It really was. Because this is what we wanted. We asked the Lord, we don't want to go on a European vacation. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And then when we live there, things get hard. Right. Because we can remember fondly European vacations, but when things are hard, you're living in a different country, and your mom's not a phone call away because she's asleep. You know what I mean? Right. And so we were just asking the Lord for just a real life experience, and man, did he give us one. And can I tell you, it was good. It really was. We got to London um, for the first time by ourselves for like a 10-day stint, I think, and for the first like two and a half days... The tube system was shut down. Now, when I say that, I'm talking about the subway system. Yeah. In a city of nine and a half million people, and three to four million people ride the tubes every day, if those are shut down, those people aren't underground anymore. They're on top, and they are everywhere. It was crazy <laughs> busy, and we walked 12 to 15 miles every day we were in London by ourselves. It was great. It really was. I know it sounds crazy, but it was. It was great. We got on the wrong train. I mean, it was just good. If I can just tell you, it was just so good. But all of that to say this is while we were on our survey trip, we hadn't even seen the country or been there or stepped foot there. But while we were on our survey trip, even though a lot of things went wrong, God deepened the call for us to go. Amen. And we were yes. super excited about that. We've been on deputation now for 10 months, and we're approaching rapidly 50% of Amen. our support. Amen which is a huge blessing to us. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't want to be deputation missionaries. We want to be missionaries that live over there and not drive on the road all the time. So we've asked the Lord just to continue to just supply that support. He's done above and beyond what we could have asked, and it's been absolutely amazing to see and be a part of. And so all of that to get to this point. England is a very needy place. England is one-eighth the size of Texas. The whole country. One-eighth the size of Texas, but it has double the amount of people. Wow. So 60 million people crammed into a tiny little land space of England. Nine and a half million of those live in London. And if you get into the metro of London, which would include Reading, which is like a 20-minute 20 20 train ride away from like pretty central London. If you include all the metro of London, you can get... Just depending on what website you click on for your Google search, you can get 12, 13, 14, 15 million people wow. that commute in and out of the city every single day. That's a lot of people, isn't it? Wow. And the Lord has called us to go there because those people need to know who Jesus Christ is. That's, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Half of the city claims to be Christian, but when you begin to dig into their Christianity, they say, well, I got baptized as a baby. Or, well, I, I, I pray this every day. Or I give a certain amount of money. And we understand from the Word of God that's not how you get to heaven. That's right. That's we right. understand that Jesus Christ is the only way. And so they need to know. But also in London, it's not just the, those that claim to be Christian, but also a very religious city in this way. There's millions of Muslims that live there. There are Buddhists there. There are Hindu there. They're the largest Hindu temple outside of India is in London, England. Wow. It's in the middle of a neighborhood. I mean, it is, it is a giant Hindu temple. When you walk up to it, you don't even feel like you're in, you're in England. You feel like you're in India. I mean, it's an incredible temple, but obviously they're teaching false doctrine. And so, right, right. so there's, there's millions of people from every corner of the globe. Over 300 languages are spoken in London. Over 300 languages, and, and I mean, every, every continent and almost every country are represented somewhere in London. And so, when you begin to minister there, you're not only ministering to British people, but you're also ministering to people from the Middle East, from Asia, from Russia, from, I mean, yeah. you name it, they're there, honestly. 
But amazing thing, something that we're excited about and that we're just praying about, and this is all just kind of ethereal dreams, if I can just say that, is that we lead people to the Lord from places that Americans can't get. You know what I mean? And that they get saved and they and their family gets saved and then God calls them to go back to start a church. Right. Whether that's in Pakistan, right. Yemen, or Russia. But they can go back. They don't need the visas. They already know the culture. They know the language. And they can go and they can start churches. And that's we're super right. excited about what God is doing and what he is beginning to do. And it's been amazing. When you get called to go somewhere, you start meeting British people everywhere. It's really cool. Listen for the accent. I guarantee there's someone in Wichita Falls from, from England. And man, they're they're fun to talk to for sure. Yeah. But they need to know who the Lord is, honestly. Right. And we're excited about what he's done and what he's doing. And we have our table over here. It has our prayer cards on it. Can I say this? Please pray for us. Amen. Amen. Pray for us. The Lord has to go before us and he has to do the work. We're just trying to be the instrument That's right. that is used on the planet, if I can say it that That's way. Right. Thank you for having us, man. It's been great to be here. The room over there in the Family Life Center is amazing. We walked in. Bo squealed with excitement. He yelled, the ball! And he started running around and riding the scooters. It's been so good to be here and just really appreciate just the hospitality and the blessing it's been. I'm super excited about the message tonight, and I want to have enough time. And so Deuteronomy chapter number 4. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter number 4. It sounds maybe like an odd uh, missions passage, but I think by the end of it, you'll see where we're going. And uh, just something that's near and dear to my heart. And can I honestly tell you that it was super convicting to me this afternoon. Just um, just the Lord, he, he worked me over, if I can say it that way. And I needed it, and it was good for me. So Deuteronomy chapter number 4, if, you, if you've read the book of Deuteronomy, the first three chapters are... Moses, he's writing to this new generation of Israelites who are about to go into the promised land, the land that flows with milk and honey. And he's about to cross over, he's about to send them over to Jordan, and he's telling them their history. He's, he's recounting the Israelites' history, and he's telling them, and if you, if you read this, these first three chapters, Moses says this a whole lot. Remember when God did this. Right. Don't forget when God did this. Remember when God did this, and he just starts to name all of these amazing events that the Israelites had seen. And then you get to chapter number 4, and Moses starts it off like a good old-fashioned preacher. He says, now therefore hearken. So because of all that I've said in the first three chapters, listen up. And he says, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that you may live. So he's saying this. I've taught you the word of God, the law of God, and if you do this, you will live. Here's, here it is. For to do them, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. He says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So, Moses says, now don't add or take away, because I have gotten directly from God, and from God to me, Amen. I have given you exactly what he said. The next verse, verse number 3, he gives an example of when the Israelites diminished and added to the words of God. Look at this. He says, your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. Now personally, I don't remember Baal Peor off the top of my head. Maybe you do, because you're a Bible scholar. Remember, I'm from Abilene. We're not too smart from that. <laughs> and so, Baal Peor is an awful story that he's reminding the people of. It's whenever, and I know, it's still Wednesday night, and we're early on in the preaching, but we're going to move on from it quick. But I get, you, you got to get this picture here. It's whenever the Israelites, the Bible talks about it in the book of Numbers, they, they departed from the Israelite camp, and they went into... Moab, and they began to what the Bible calls commit whoredom with the people of Moab. Right. And they began not only to <clears throat> fornicate with them, but they also began to worship their false gods. Right. Now, we know what God said in Exodus chapter 20. He says, have no other gods before me, right? And so if they're worshiping another god, that means, well, that means that god is before him. And so they're worshiping these false gods, and when they begin to do this, God goes to Moses and he says, Moses, I want you to call the leadership of Israel together. And so the leadership of Israel gathers together. But while this is happening, God has sent a plague of judgment upon the Israelites. And it's rolling through the camp and it's killing thousands upon thousands of people. 
And God tells Moses and the, and the leadership of Israel, he says, I want you to kill everyone that's been involved at Moab. And so they begin to fulfill the judgment of God. And people are beginning to gather at the door of the tabernacle, asking Moses and asking God to stop the plague because thousands of innocent people are passing away. Well, from that crowd comes the Israelite man and what the Bible says, the Midianite woman that started it all. Well, a guy named Phineas takes a spear and he kills both of those people and the plague stops. Now, that's an intense story, right? right? But Moses is trying to remind the people, hey, this is what happened when someone added and took away. Because look at the rest of the verse with me now. He says this, For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God, have destroyed them from among you. But ye, you that did cleave, that, that held on to the Lord, your God, are alive, every one of you, this day. And then Moses continues on in what, what scholars call this chapter, is this sermon of obedience. He says this, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land, whither ye go to possess it. Have you ever noticed preachers, when they, get the, when they want to get a point across, it's like they're just hitting the nail on the head over and over and over. That's kind of what Moses is doing here. He's saying, look, I've taught you what God has said. I've taught you what God has said. Look at this. Keep therefore, verse number 6, and do them. For this is your wisdom and understanding. If you do the law of God, you'll be wise and understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And then Moses, he asked a rhetorical question. He says this, for what nation is there so great who have God so nigh, so close unto them as the Lord our God is in all these things that we call upon him for? Now, false False religions back in that day, their gods were not close to them. Their gods were far off, and they tried to please them, and they had no idea how their gods would respond. And it's kind of the same idea right now with false religions. If you go and study Islam or Hinduism, they, they are worshiping these gods, but they don't know how their gods feel about them. Their gods are far off. They're not close. They hold, right. they hold I mean, they're not in existence, we understand that, but in their teachings, they hold them very far away, right? That's right. And so he's saying, we have God close to us. Look at verse number 8. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Baal Peor is a perfect example of a religion that is teaching things that are not righteous and upright. And then look right here with, with me now, because the text takes a big transition. From 8 to 9. Verses 1 through 8 are all about the nation. You see that? And look at verse number 9 with me. Only take heed to who? Thyself. And keep thy soul diligently. Now, that phrase right there is like the linchpin of this whole passage right here. It needs a little bit of unpacking, so I want to get into it. It says, only take heed to and keep. Heed and keep are actually the same Hebrew word here. Now, I'm not going to try to say it because it would sound bad. But I want you to understand what, what the root meaning of this is. And it's right here. Protect, guard, or attend to. So he's saying only protect, guard, and attend to yourself and your soul. And then the word diligently I love this. When you get down to brass tacks, it, it's right here. To turn or gather embers. To turn or gather embers diligently. Now, personally, I like fire. Does anybody else like fire? Okay, we got two. All you other pyros don't want to admit to it. Commit an arson out there, you see. So, no, our house has a fireplace. That was the one like requirement I had when we bought our house in Lubbock. I, I told my wife, I want a fireplace. Now we live in Lubbock. It doesn't get that cold, but I wanted one. Sure. And so we bought our house. It had everything my wife wanted and a fireplace. <laughs> so we uh, had a snow day in Lubbock. And I'm going to assume Wichita Falls is probably about the same as it is when it snows in Lubbock. And, and, and just correct me if I'm wrong. I'll explain it to you. So they say, and a lot of times in Lubbock, they, we say they threatened that it's going to snow. And so we, um, 
all loving people go to the grocery store. Right, right. Okay. I don't know, maybe, do they buy bread here? Oh, yeah. And milk? <laughs> so you have milk toast, I guess. And since 2020, toilet paper, right? right. Yeah. Oh. So, so all the bread, all the milk, it's gone. And it's a snow day in Lubbock. And so we go to the grocery store, we buy the essentials of bread and milk. And then also hit the freezer section because you got to have junk food whenever all you're going to do is sit around because that's the healthiest thing you can do. And so we, we went and we, we went to the grocery store, went to sleep that night, woke up the next morning to probably eight inches of snow. Wow. That's a lot of snow in Lubbock. The town is shut down. Right. Completely. Right. And so schools are shut down. They're calling it before it even started snowing. I mean, it's great. And so I tell my wife, babe, let's, let's start a fire. She's like, yeah. So we had some firewood left over from a church event. So I go outside, I grab some logs, I throw them into the fireplace. And do y'all have thrifty nickels here? Yeah. It's like a free newspaper. Right. It's like the grocery store. It says take one. It's got all the garage sales in it. Yeah. So for a youth activity, I grabbed like 150. I know it says take one, but if they're free, <laughs> 150 times free is still free, right? And so I took a whole lot. And um, we, we had a bunch left over from this youth activity. So I'm trying to burn, I'm trying to start this fire with these logs in the fireplace. And I'm burning through thrifty nickels, like left and right. I mean, I'm burning through them like crazy. And I can't get this fire started. And I mean, to my shame, I tried for probably 45 minutes to an hour. You can judge me, it's cool. And so my wife walks up behind me, she says, hey, hey Colin, can, can I help you start this fire? And I said, I said, because I'm spiritual. I said, sure, do whatever you want to do. Yeah, exactly. And so I step back, and my wife kind of just takes a look at the fireplace. Now, before I move on, I need to give you a little parenthetical thought here. My wife is from Washington State, there you go. north of Seattle, and they grew up using a wood stove as their only heat source. She's a fire expert. And so she looks at it, and she goes, okay, Colin, where... Where, where's your kindling? Well, you. I look at her and I go, yeah. what's kindling? Yeah. <laughs> she explains kindling to me, so I go outside and I gather some kindling and I give it to her. And she arranges it underneath the logs. You know, yeah, you're all shaking your head to know how to make a fire. And everybody else is going, you're dumb. I know. Okay. So she puts it underneath the logs and she takes the thrifty nickel. She says, hand me the thrifty nickel. I said, I already tried the thrifty nickels. They don't work. And she said, hand it to me. So I handed it to her. She starts rolling it up. I said, tight. She folds it a few times. And now it's like a rock. It's really hard, but it's still, you know, lightable. So she lights this thrifty nickel on fire, and it doesn't instantaneously combust. Right. Well, she's farther along than I am at this point. And so she sticks this thrifty nickel into the kindling, and she has a fire in the fireplace. She's light years ahead of me. <laughs> and so this, this kindling starts to burn. She starts to work it a little bit. She's blowing on it. She's trying to get it going and stoked. And then the logs light on fire. She's a fire expert. I'm telling you. Well, I know how to keep a fire going. All you got to do is add wood to the fire, right? And so I start throwing the wood in there. And I like my fire so hot. I feel like a hot dog at, at QT. You know what I'm talking about? You know, and it's like kind of like pulling your eyebrows back like that. Yeah, I like it so hot. I mean, you feel like you're roasting. And so I get this thing blazing all day long. And it's now probably 10 o'clock at night. I'm like, I'm going to bed. And she's like, we can't go to bed. I'm like, Why not? She's like, we'll wake up dead. <laughs> because I've got this fire, I mean, ripping in the fireplace. And so we have to stay up an inordinate amount of time, but it's actually okay because there's still snow on the ground, which means Lubbock's going to be shut down for at least a whole nother six days or something. Like <laughs> and so we wake up the next morning, the fire died down, we wake up the next morning, and I'm like, hey, let's start a fire. She's like, yeah. I'm like, I'll go get some kindling, because I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, she, she says, no, 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 you don't need any kindling, just get some logs. I'm like, okay, I'll get some logs. And so I grab some logs. I'm like, babe, you got to have kindling to start a fire. And she's like, just, just, you know, just put the logs in. So I put the logs in, and she grabs um, a tool, a fire tool. And it's got a handle. It's got a long, and it's got a spike on the end with a hook. Right. I call it the fire poker. Right. And so she takes our fire poker, and she starts to stir underneath the logs where all the stuff had fallen, right? 
Well, you already know where I'm going. It started to glow red, right? I look at her, I'm like, you are cheating. This is not, a, this is not, whatever. So she starts to stir around, and it, it's starting to gather heat again because there's oxygen flowing into those coals, and they start to glow red. And then all she has to do, you know, she blows on it, right? She blows on it, and my favorite noise in the world, right that. And the whole thing lights up, and we're rolling. That's what Moses was talking about when he said the word diligently, to turn or gather embers. So look at verse number 9. He says, only take heed, only protect, guard, and attend to yourself and your soul. Like when you're having to turn or gather embers to keep a fire going. Now, God knew what time I needed to be alive. Because I'm not a good fire starter. But I know how to adjust the thermostat. <laughs> but back in the day, they didn't have thermostats. Right. And fires were the way that they had protection, how they stayed alive, how they stayed warm. And so whenever Moses gives this picture of a fire, they know exactly how important this is. They know exactly how important it is for them to be fed because their fire is hot enough to cook, because it's going to protect them, because it's going to give them warmth, it's going to keep their newborn children alive. I mean, all of the things. Are you following me here? And so when Moses says that you need to protect, guard, and attend to yourself and your soul like a fire that's right. going to keep you alive, right. they understand the picture. Right. They get it in their minds. Right. And we have to understand that they had to turn that fire all the time. They had to gather wood. They had to, they had to completely work that fire at all times. Someone had to be attending to that at all times. But why did Moses want them to do this? Look at the next phrase of the verse. He says this. Lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart all the days, I read it wrong, and lest, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. Now, when I read that, I think this, what could they forget? And what had their eyes seen? Now, this is the Israelites. They just came through the wilderness waters. So let's go back in Israelite history. Let's say Egypt, right? They were slaves in Egypt. Moses came from the backside of the desert. He goes to Pharaoh and he says, God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, no. Well, Moses, Moses says, okay, if you don't let people go, God's going to send judgment. And Pharaoh's like, I don't know your God. Well, this happened, we know, ten times, right? The Nile turned to blood. That's amazing, right? I mean, if you're out here in the Red River, I understand it's called the Red River, but if like you get some rain and it starts to flow, because I've driven past that bridge a lot and it doesn't look like a river, but, <laughs> but, but if it's flowing good, and then one day you go out there and it's blood red, yeah. mm. would you remember that? Yeah. And, and then not only did, I'm not, I'm not going to name them all, but just think about these. I mean, these are incredible Miracles, but also judgments of God. The dust of the ground. Have you ever seen a picture of Egypt? Is it a dusty place? Yeah. I would say it is. It reminds me of Lubbock. <laughs> it's a dusty, dusty place. And can you imagine the dust of the ground turning into lice? Oh, man. I, I mean, yeah. It's, everybody's itching now. <laughs> I'm talking. And, and, and then God sent a judgment of locusts. He sent a judgment of hailstones. Boils. Uh, from the tops of people's heads to the bottom of their feet. Ouch. That's nasty. Yeah. And then my favorite one, I haven't mentioned it yet, but the frogs. Yeah. <laughs> can you imagine the frogs? Yeah. I mean, Moses tells them, if you can go back and read it, Moses tells Pharaoh, listen, if you don't let God's people go, everywhere you go, there's going to be a frog. You're going to go into your bedroom, frog. Your closet, frog. <laughs> The microwave, a frog. <laughs> I mean, he's telling them everywhere. The most private place you, you can imagine. Guess what's going to be waiting on you? A frog. Yeah. And then once finally Pharaoh decided it was over, he says, okay, one more night with the frogs, right? Exactly. And then the next morning, what happens? They all died. They didn't just go away. Right. They just died. Right. And they're dead on the ground. And then the Bible says that they gathered them into heaps. And the Bible says this, they stunk. Now it's a divine judgment of stinkiness, right? I mean, are you following me here? I mean, I'm talking, this is bad. And then, let's go, let's move forward, right? And they get into, they, they're, they're singing the songs of freedom, they're out, they're praising God, and 
They get into it, and they get to the edge of the Red Sea, and they go, wait a minute. How are we going to cross the Red Sea? And they look back, and the strongest army in the world is coming after them. They see the dust flying, right? Well, Moses goes to God, and he's like, hey, what am I supposed to do here? Right? God says, raise your hands up at the bank of the Red Sea. Puts his arms up with his rod in his hand, and the Red Sea parts down the middle. And the wind is blowing so hard, like the wind of God is blowing so hard that the ground is dry, right? They get across, the last Israelite steps over, this is how I imagine it in my mind, the last Israelite gets pulled up out of the bank, they all look back, the Egyptian army's in the middle of the Red Sea, and two walls of water crush them. Yeah. That is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And then they're in the wilderness, and, and they get hungry, and so God sends manna. What is it? That's, that's the literal interpretation. No, I don't know. What is it? It's manna, right? And so they, they go out, they gather the manna, they eat it, they have enough for the day. The next morning they go out and there's still food from the sky. Well, they get sick of manna and they say, we want some meat. And I'm a Texan. I understand the need for some beef. I like it. But God says, you want meat, I'll give you meat. And he gives them quail. Now, I know some people like quail. I think it's a waste of time. <laughs> it's like a mini chicken nugget, you know what I mean? It's like one of those nuggets you hope they didn't count at Chick-fil-A as your five count, right? I mean, you're just like, man, I hope that didn't count. Because it's so tiny, but can you imagine? I mean, it, it says there's so much quail. The Bible literally uses this term terminology. It was coming out their nostrils. It's coming out their noses. And then they, they get thirsty and they say, Moses, you brought us out here to die. God says, strike the rock. So Moses takes it. Boom! It's the rock and water gushes out. It's not like a trickle. I mean, it's flowing for all these people and their animals. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. I mean, isn't that... Those are amazing miracles. Yeah, right. And then I think of the sons of Korah, right? right? You remember the sons of Korah? They said, Moses, we're sick of you. Yeah. We're sick that you're the only one leading us. And Moses is like, if you're on God's side, stand over here. But if you're with them... Go over there. And what happens? The earth opens up and swallows them and then closes on top of them. Yeah, right. Can you imagine the gossip sessions later? Right. I'm so sick of Moses. Hey, listen here. You got that one person in the gossip circle that doesn't want to do it, right? Listen here. You remember the sons of Korah? I'm about to back away. You're going to swallow too. I mean, can you imagine? That is crazy, isn't it? And they saw miracle after miracle after miracle over and over and over again. And then Moses says this. Protect, guard, and attend to yourself and your soul like a fire that's going to keep you alive. Yes. Lest you forget. Amen. And they depart from thy heart. And he says, don't forget them. Don't let them depart. But do this. Verse number 9. Teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. And then we have a good Texas word here at the verse number 10. Especially. Yeah. It's especially without the E. He says this The day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words. Do you see the difference between this verse and the verse 8? Yeah. Moses was saying this God spoke to me, and I said what God said. God spoke to me, and I told you what God said. God commanded me, and I told you exactly what he said. Look at verse number 10 with me again. Gather me, the people, this is God speaking, together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. And ye came near, Moses is reminding them, and you stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness, and the Lord spake unto you, not, not to Moses. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard, look at this right here. Ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude. Only ye heard a voice, and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. Here it is. Even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. They heard the very voice of God give them the ten commandments. Is that not amazing? 
And when you go back and you read that, that the details of that, the, the mountain burning with fire and darkness and clouds and thick darkness, they are so awestruck by the power of God and the sight of His presence on top of this mountain. Before they even get close, they fall on their face right. and beg Moses to beg God not to kill them. Right. Right. And then they heard, they heard the voice of God speak to them. And Moses says this, don't forget as a New Testament saint, I say, how could they? Right. Are you following me? Right. I, I think to myself, how could they forget the frogs? Sure. How could they forget the Red Sea? How could they forget the manna and the quail and the water? But then how could they, how could they forget the literal voice of God? Amen. But if you've read your Old Testament, they forgot Read the book of Judges, right? Yes, it gets worse and worse. Every man doing what? That which is right in their own eyes. Right. Mm -hmm. But then, not only Judges, but then you get into the prophets. Man, those guys are preaching what God has said. And what are God's people doing? I mean, they're threatening to kill them. They're torturing them. I mean, it's awful, isn't it? And it's just getting, it got worse and worse and worse. Somewhere along the way, Come on. they didn't teach it to their sons. Come on. And they didn't teach it to their sons' sons. That's yeah. right. And they forgot. And since becoming a missionary and being on deputation, I think of the field that I'm going to, and I, and I talked to your associate pastor earlier about this a little bit. England has a heritage. Yeah, that's right. Like, I didn't understand until I walked foot in the streets of London, seriously. Where they had, I mean, some of the most powerful preachers preaching in their country mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Seeing revivals and people saved, people getting right with God, alcoholics being sober. I mean, I'm talking, I'm preaching like, like the world hadn't seen in a long time. And, and they had amazing missionaries being sent all around the world. I mean, George Whitfield came to America and was preaching in the state of Georgia. And it was so hot because England is nice and chill. I mean, it really is. It's like 65 degrees all year long. And he's in Georgia, and he's preaching like six, seven times a day. And it's so hot, he almost dies. Mm. And he's in bed for two days, and he gets up two days later, and he starts preaching again. I'm talking preachers that were doing it because they knew the power of God was on them, and the power of God was going through their preaching. Right. And people were being saved, and revivals were being started. And, I mean, revivals that we call the Great Awakening type stuff. And now when you start to walk the streets of London and you can go to Charles Spurgeon's right. church that he pastored. And people don't know who Charles Spurgeon is. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's crazy. And you can go, you can go all throughout this country and you can, you can see the Christian here, history, but nobody remembers. And so now they've gotten to a point where Though they were sending the gospel here, we need to send the gospel back. Right, man. Because there's millions of people that will, will, will die without the Lord and spend eternity separated from Him. That's right. But I also am an American before I'm a missionary. And I think about our own country. Yes, sir. And I'm, and I'm not in dire straits about it. I believe the Lord can do whatever He wants to do. That's right. And I believe the Lord can do something, but I believe that we are witnessing. We are witnessing with our own eyes the forgetting of America. Yeah, exactly. And we can walk, and you can, if you've been to D.C., you can walk the halls of the buildings. And you know what's on the walls in marble? This yeah, book. Exactly. And politicians that lie on TV on a regular basis yeah. walk by those walls. And they see it, and they have no idea. Right. And they can go to the microphone and say, our nation's never been a Christian nation, even though they walk by the yeah. words of God himself every day. And so I think about those two nations, that I have a heart and a love and a desire to see God do something absolutely amazing in both of them. And I think to myself, what happened? Yes. Well, the way for a nation to remember is individual remembrance. Look at verse number nine. Yeah. It, if it's going to happen, you have to protect, guard, and attend to 
your cell Amen. and your soul yes, sir. like a fire that's going to stay alive. Amen. That's going to keep you alive. That's right. Amen. 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 And so what happened was this. Is what happened to me today. My kids were wearing on me. I'm, I'll just be transparent with you. I know I'm a missionary. I'm supposed to be spiritual. I'm sorry. You're going to get the real Colin Hendricks. My kids were wearing on me. And I just needed a few moments. But I'm with my kids like 24 7. Right and when I was on staff at Bethany, I, I, I looked forward to deputation when I was going to be with my kids all the time. I, because I felt like I never, I, I got to see them, but I never got to see them, you know? And I, I just looked forward to being able to spend all that family time together and be together and all. And I mean, I just thought it's going to be pie in the sky type stuff. And it is, I really, I really is. But at the same time, I can forget those days when I was sitting in my office and it was 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night because we were doing something that needed all that work, thinking, I wish I was there putting my kids down. I think about it, and today I did, and I'm almost out of time, and I'm almost done, I promise, but I, I say this, how quick are we to forget, right? Yes. Right. E even, even something like that, spending time with my kids, and I love my kids, I really do. I call them hooligans because it's a, it's a term of endearment, really. <laughs> And, and I think about those times where I was at, I was up at the church property working on something, working on the parking lot, working on a remodel, whatever it was, and I'm wishing I was putting my kids down to bed, right? But now I'm putting my kids down, and sometimes it feels more like a chore than something enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's go. That's just an example of how we can forget. But think about this: you've been in services where God spoke to you, That's right. and you said, "God, I'm going to do this." But then somewhere along the way, what happened? You didn't do it. And then you came to services where you were in church, and it just felt like a chore. Right? And it was like, man, what? Every week, every Wednesday, every Sunday. And, I, and I'm not trying, I'm not getting on you because that's not my place. But I, I, I want to do this. I just want to remind you tonight that if you remember the goodness of God in your life, it'll make you want to do more for it. Amen. And can I tell you, when I'm struggling on the road or whatever, when I'm struggling, it's because I forgot what God has done. That's right. And can I tell you, as New Testament saints, yeah, we haven't seen the Red Sea part. We haven't. And we haven't seen manna fall from the sky. Be pretty cool. We haven't seen people walk around with boils head to toe because God said it was going to happen. We didn't see, we, I mean, there's so many things we haven't seen. But we experienced the Holy Spirit and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And that is the greatest miracle. Amen. That's when right. you get saved, I mean, God takes you, an enemy of Him, and He adopts you into His family. Amen. Wraps you in a robe of righteousness. And the God who remembers everything casts your sins as far as... The east is from the west. Amen. And can right. I say this? Maybe, 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 if you've lacked the desire to obey him lately, it's because you maybe just hadn't stirred your fire in a while. Amen. And reminded yourself of the goodness that he's bestowed upon you. And you say, well, I watch the news and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of good out there. Mm -hmm. But if you read the book, it says this, the earth is full of yep. the goodness of the Lord. Which means this, if it's full and you don't see it, yeah, maybe you're walking like that. Right. Right? Right. And here's how it relates to missions right here, okay? Is we want to go to England where we don't know what goes ahead of us. We don't know what's going to happen. But we want to go and remember places like Southwest Baptist Church in Wichita Falls. Yes. Where we felt welcomed and loved and had a good old time right here with y'all. Yeah. And we want to look back and remember the goodness that we experienced, the goodness of God we experienced here when we're over there on that tiny island. And it's hard. But we also want to come back and be able to tell you all about how God bestowed his goodness over there and saved people's marriages, saved their souls. We saw people restored and parents restored to their children. I mean, we want to talk about the miracles that we see there, and we want to remember the miracles that we get to experience here. 
And so maybe tonight, and for Colin Hendricks, tonight, like that happened in your missions apartment with my children. I was like, ugh, right? Can I just tell you, maybe tonight you just need to reminisce with the Lord. Because if you turn your fire, it will give you the desire to obey him more. That's the whole message right there. Just turn the fire of remembrance so you have that desire to obey him even more. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. Thankful for the challenge. Lord, we ask that you just bless this time and the remainder of the time. And we pray that you just bless out this Baptist church like you have. In Jesus' name.